Welcome to our webinar, The Final Tangible Property Repair Regulations and Fixed Asset Review, Opportunities for 2021 and Beyond. Today's speaker will be the principal from our Chicago office, Lester Cook. KBKG was established in 1999. We have offices across the U.S., including Illinois, Arizona, Georgia, New York, Texas, and Pasadena, California, where we are headquartered. We provide turnkey tax solutions to tax preparers and businesses. Our engineers and tax experts have performed thousands of tax projects, resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in benefit for our clients. Our team is a diverse mix of tax specialists, attorneys, and engineers from various disciplines. This combination of talent allows us to be the best at what we do and maximize results for our clients. KBKG is a preferred provider for thousands of tax preparers across the country. I will now introduce our speaker. Lester Cook has nearly 20 years of experience in the tax specialty service industry. He is a principal of KBKG's fixed asset review practice. He is a certified member of the American Society of Cost Segregation Professionals, a group that he has been part of since 2008. Throughout his career, Lester has completed cost segregation analysis on thousands of properties ranging from office space leasehold improvements to multi-billion dollar industrial complexes and hotel and resort projects. He has worked with many Fortune 500 companies successfully representing his claims to both IRS and financial auditors. Prior to KBKG, Lester led the PwC Central Region Cost Segregation Center of Excellence, providing engineering-based cost segregation project management oversight and expertise to all fixed asset teams throughout the U.S. and Canada. He was a recipient of the 2008 PwC Greater Chicago Market Chairman's Award for Outstanding Leadership. I will now turn it over to Lester. At the end of our presentation on this, these tangible property regulations, we'll, we will have covered all of the bullets you see displayed here. Most of what I cover will be presented from the standpoint of a taxpayer that owns a building or leasehold improvements. We'll start out by discussing the unit of property and the eight distinct building systems that must be identified according to the tangible property regulations. We'll go over the definition of improvement and the step-by-step -step through the bar test. We'll spend some time talking through the regs and how they apply to the evaluation of certain types of building components, specifically focusing on HVAC and roofing. We'll demonstrate why it's important to recognize retirements, and we'll also show you how you can determine the retirement uh, the remaining depreciable basis on uh, building components that have been retired. Though not directly related to buildings, we'll talk about uh, rules related to materials and supplies. We'll look at the routine maintenance safe harbor and how that applies to buildings. And we'll also look at the safe harbor for small taxpayers and the de minimis rules. Finally, we'll wrap up with an overview of the retail restaurant industry safe harbor. Now we're gonna turn the corner and dig a little into the details of these property, uh, the tangible property regulations. Um, these regulations are effective for all taxpayers other than quote, small qualifying taxpayers for tax years beginning on or after January 1st, 2014. We're referring here to the regs that were issued in final form on September, in September of 2013. These regs were previously issued in temporary form back in 2011, so we've had several years to adjust and prepare for the changes that were required. Some of the more capital intensive taxpayers that were early adopters may have chosen to take advantage of the tax favorable characteristics of the regs. In the years leading up to these final regulations, there were a number of instructors suggesting that everybody needed to be filing 3115s, which was not necessarily the case. The final regs provided rules for distinguishing between a currently deductible repair and a capitalized expenditure. Prior to the regs, controller might look at an invoice for $30,000 and assume that's a big cost, therefore it needs to be capitalized. And they would capitalize and depreciate an asset over the appropriate depreciable life. These regs provided some guidance around that and offer up lots and lots of examples to help us understand how to navigate those rules. Yes, they were adopted with a change in accounting method using a form 3115, oftentimes with a very favorable 41A adjustment calculation. Change number 184 is the most common changes uh, that allows you to take an item that had previously been depreciated and make it a current year expense by taking the remaining depreciable life as an expense in the year of change. Really one of the main reasons that we're talking about this right now is because there is a five-year scope limitation um, related to doing a, as an accounting method change. So essentially you're precluded from taking 
a or performing a change in accounting method on the same assets or doing the same change in accounting for five year period um, most taxpayers that that went through this this uh, exercise of adopting these tangible property regulations did so back in 2014 um, meaning five years later we're looking at 2019 2020 tax filing seasons as an opportunity to potentially look back again um, at items that may have been misclassified or you know in the interim between 2015 to 2020 um, what are those accounting methods that were put into place may or may not have been um, you know, followed as as thoroughly as they should have been so uh, let me go ahead and address the and, and expectations some folks may have about the distinction between repair versus capitalization. You may have come to this webinar expecting there to be a black and white answer. Um, unfortunately, there are no bright line tests with these regulations. Um, it's very much dependent on the facts and circumstances surrounding a particular expenditure. The regulations describe the concept of a unit of property. In order for uh, um, in order to properly evaluate our facts and circumstances relating an expenditure, we need to understand how that unit of property is affected. The expenditure must be evaluated in the context of the unit of property. So let's look at some simple examples. If we spend thirty thousand dollars for for five new plumbing fixtures, where the unit of property is the plumbing system in a small five thousand square foot building. We might assume that this is to be a capital expenditure because the $30,000 is likely a significant cost relative to the plumbing system in such a small building. However, the same $30,000 expenditure for five new plumbing fixtures where the unit of property is a plumbing system in a large 50,000 square foot building, we're more likely to conclude that this is a repair expense as this would likely represent a very small portion of the total plumbing system. As you see in our examples, there are some items are replaced, require different treatment, because the facts and circumstances of how they relate to the unit of property. As you think about the unit of property, one principle that you should begin to understand is that the smaller your unit of property, the more likely it is that the expenditure that you incurred will need to be capitalized. So let's take a closer look at this term unit of property. If you think about it, an asset can have many component parts. However, a single unit of property will consist of a group of components that are all functionally interdependent. For the unit of property to function correctly, it needs to have all of its component parts in place. Another way to evaluate functional interdependence is to observe when the components are placed into service. If you would only place one component in service in conjunction with the other components, then you might conclude that they are functionally interdependent. There are special rules for different types of property. For plant property, the unit of property is further broken down into each component or common group of components that performs a quote unquote, discrete and major function or an operation in an industrial process within the functionality inter interdependent machinery or equipment. Network assets include railroad track, oil and gas pipelines, water and sewer pipelines, power and transmission distribution lines, um, telephone and cable lines. For network assets, your particular facts and circumstances or industry guidance from the Treasury Department, Department and the IRS will determine the unit of property. For this webinar, we're really going to focus most of our attention on buildings and leasehold improvements, which covers about 85% of the taxpayers' questions out there. So back to the unit of properties. So in the context of a building, the entire building and its structural components together constitute a single unit of property. Notice that a building structure consists of a building and its structural components other than the structural components designated as building systems. This was all as part of the, the, the regulations. There are eight building systems that have been identified in those regs. Those include HVAC, plumbing, electrical, elevators, escalators, fire, and, uh, fire protection and alarm systems, security system, and gas distribution systems. Everything else would be just considered part of the building structure, the building envelope. Any quality cost segregation study should break out these systems for the taxpayer. In our example earlier about the, replacing the plumbing fixtures, we compared replacements to the entire plumbing system when determining whether it was a repair or an expense. This is an example of why it's important to have these systems broken out within the total building cost. 
For leased buildings, the unit of property is viewed a little differently depending on whether you're a lessor or a lessee. For the lessor, the entire building constitutes the unit of property. As discussed in the previous slide, the lessor needs to consider the basic building system serving the entire building and evaluate modifications for those systems in that context. For the lessee, the unit of property is limited to the portion of the building that's subject to the lease. So any future improvement made to the lessee space are combined into the existing unit of property under the lease. So the building systems must still be considered, however, only that portion within the lease space is what would be included. So we're looking at an example of, you know, the plumbing system in the lessee space might be limited to just the break room and the kitchen sinks. Perhaps they also have a dedicated restroom um, with associated plumbing fixtures that they're responsible for. So in our example, a lessee in a large building remodels the dedicated restroom located in their space. If the, lease, the lessee performs the work, it's likely going to be a capital improvement because the work was done on a major portion of the plumbing system located within their space. Now, let's say the lessee occupies one floor of a five-story building. If the same work were instead performed by the lessor, it might be treated as a repair expense as it only affects a small amount of the entire building's plumbing system. So the last concept I want to introduce about the unit of property is the depreciation consistency rule. It's very common to have multiple asset classifications with different recovery periods within the same building. We've discussed that the building is a single unit of property and may have several and may have multiple building systems within that. But these systems within the building may have multiple asset classifications and recovery periods. If a component of a building is a separate class of property, then it's treated as a separate property unit as well. So when we perform a cost segregation study on a building, we're typically identifying five, seven, and 15 year makers property associated with the building. Those items we've segregate, segregated into different recovery periods are no longer part of the building unit of property. Consider our example of, of a cost segregation study done in a hotel where a portion of the electrical system is segregated into asset class 57.0 with a five-year recovery period and asset class 00 0.3 with a 15-year recovery period. Those five-year property, the five-year property includes some decorative chandeliers, some wall sconces, things like that. The 15-year property includes some outdoor parking lot lighting. Any future expenditure to replace decorative lighting should be compared to the five-year lighting system costs when evaluating it for um, either it's gonna be a repair or a capital cost. It would not be appropriate to compare that expenditure to the entire lighting system of the building, including the 39-year building, life uh, building lighting. The depreciation consistency rule reinforces my comment earlier about the importance of breaking out and summarizing the units of property included within the building. So according to the tangible property regs, an improvement is any amount paid paid for that either one, results in a betterment to a unit of property, two, adapts a unit of property to a new or a different use, or three, restores the unit of property. If any of these criteria are satisfied, the asset is an improvement and must be capitalized. This is commonly referred to as the bar test. Notice that each test is in reference to the unit of property. Most work performed on the building is done to make it better to some degree, but does that really mean that it's a capital improvement? Not necessarily. We'll look a little bit further on the next slide. If we adapt a warehouse to a, sh or to a showroom space or convert a restaurant to a resale space, we've changed the use of the property and the cost conversion will be capitalized. We'll look at that in, a, uh, in more detail a little bit later. And then finally, we've also got some, some other examples from the regs that talk about what a, uh, a restoration is um, in the context of repair and maintenance. So what is a betterment? A betterment is something that corrects a material condition or defect. Uh, a betterment is also something that is a, a material addition. Um, it could be an enlargement, an expansion, or an extension. For example, if you lease a 10,000 square foot building and you add 2,000 square feet um, you know, onto that property, you'd have a betterment. Um, a betterment would also be a material increase in the capacity, the productivity, the efficiency, strength, quality, or output of an item. 
So for example, if you replace asphalt shingles with new solar shingles, you have a betterment. However, it might not be so easy to de determine when comparing one asphalt shingle to another type of asphalt shingle. So one thing to keep in mind is that technology is always improving and sometimes it may actually be difficult to replace a component with one that truly is comparable. If you're replacing a 20 year old HVAC unit, I'm fairly confident that you're not gonna be able to find a, uh, a same or similar SEER rating um, to the, the unit that you had from 20 years ago. So in situations like that, the new unit isn't necessarily a betterment. Um, if you're replacing a, a quote unquote builder grade quality from 20 years ago with a quote unquote builder grade quality unit today, um, it seems unlikely that you would have a betterment. So again, it very, very facts and circumstances driven here. Um, although we're focusing on a, a material change, the IRS has not defined what that means. Um, so, you know, it still comes back to the facts and circumstances when comparing the facts to those of the examples provided within the regs. So let's, uh, let's walk through a few examples of betterments. So in, in the regs, an example is given of asbestos removal not being considered a betterment. Asbestos doesn't have to be removed, it could just be contained. So its presence is not necessarily considered a defect that needs an improvement. Um, in another example from the regs, a taxpayer purchased an assisted living facility that needed work done at the time of purchase. The taxpayer took possession of and operated the facility and also immediately began to perform some of the extensive repairs to bring that facility up to a higher quality condition. The taxpayer might be inclined to think that because the facility was operational, the then through the entire time that the work uh, was being completed, it would be considered a betterment. The service would likely say that the taxpayer bought the facility at a discount because it needed work and therefore the quote unquote extensive repairs were just ameliorating or correcting a pre-existing condition and should be capitalized. Um, if you reconfigure an office space by adding more cubes, spend $30,000 on 50 more electrical outlets or data jacks, um, you're adding new assets and that's likely a betterment. Um, you should consider how significant the cost is compared to the overall electrical power system, but you know, something like that just on the surface seem, seems like it would be a betterment. Um, another roof shingle example is wood shingles. Um, in most parts of the country, you really don't use them or they're not really permitted for, for replacements. So asphalt shingles are stronger and safer, but not considered a betterment because of the way that the technology has changed. Um, if instead of a standard asphalt shingle, you chose to go with a super lightweight composite shingle, um, maintenance-free, 50-year warranty, um, you know, class A fire rating, all of that fun stuff, you're, you're probably looking at a, a betterment in that situation. So what is an adaptation? So we, we covered the B in the betterment test. Now let's let's cover the A for, for adaptation. So if, if a taxpayer incurs a cost to adapt something to a new or different use, then they need to capitalize the costs associated with that improvement. So in our example here, the taxpayer is converting a manufacturing building into a showroom for its business purposes. The scope of the work seems rather typical for the kinds of, of things that you might think of as a repair or expense under other circumstances. Um, you know, replacing some lights, painting the walls, um, you know, changing the layout around a little bit. But really the, the issue at hand here is the change of use. And that's what triggers the need for capitalization with respect to this improvement. Um, if the same type of work, you know, replacing the lights, painting the walls, you know, replacing some other components, was really related to the manufacturing operation, um, those same types of, of costs may be considered a repair expense, um, assuming they're not a betterment or a restoration. So again, very, very facts and circumstances driven um, questions that, that need to be considered. So now onto the R of the, the bar test is a restoration. So in order, to have a restoration, one of the following events must have occurred. Um, either there's a, a restoration, um, could, have, could be an amount paid for the replacement of a major component or a substantial structural part 
of a unit of property. It could also be an amount paid to return a unit of property to its ordinary operating condition if the property has deteriorated into a state of disrepair and is no longer functional for its intended use. Um, three, it, it could be uh, for an amount paid to rebuild the unit of property to a like new condition after the end of its class life, which is typically defined as the, um, the ADS recovery period. Four is a, a restoration could be for the replacement of a component of a unit of property for which the taxpayer has properly deducted a loss um, other than a casualty loss or taken into account the adjusted basis, realizing gain or loss resulting from sale or exchange. And then finally, a restoration could be the amount paid um, for the restoration of damage to a unit of property for which a taxpayer has taken a basis adjustment related to a casualty loss. So on our previous slide, we referred to a major component of a unit of property. Um, a major component would be one that performs a, a discrete and critical function in the operating of the, the unit of property. So some examples here include you know, the lighting system, um, the air conditioning system, the flooring, um, you know, so on and so forth. So a substantial structural part is a part or a combination of parts that compromise that comprises a larger portion or physical structure of the unit of property. So here in the context of a building, an amount is, um, is for the replacement of a major component or sub such substantial structural part if the replacement includes a part or a combination of parts that comprises a major component or a significant portion of a major component. Um, same would be true if the replacement includes a, a part or combination of parts that comprise a large portion of the physical structure of a building or any system. So to say that a, a little bit cleaner and a little bit easier, um, let's let's look at our example. So we've we've got you know 50% of the lighting of a building is replaced. A, a restoration probably occurred. Um, although the final regulations don't really provide a bright line test, um, we can go through the examples that that are are outlined, and they would suggest that the IRS doesn't consider the replacement of one third or less of a unit of property to be a replacement. Um, any incidental component generally will not constitute a, a major component, even though it may perform a discrete and critical function. An example there would be like a thermostat as part of the HVAC system. So, um, in the final regs, the restoration standards must be applied to all major components of the building or the unit of property. So step one is to identify the major components within the building system, and step two is to determine whether a significant portion has been replaced. So in, in our example, we describe an office building HVAC system where there are three furnaces, three AC units, and then the associated ductwork throughout the building. If one of those furnaces breaks down and is replaced with a new furnace, has a restoration occurred? The three furnaces in, in our example here work together um, to perform a critical function of serving the HVAC system and would together comprise a major component. However, replacing only one of the three furnaces is really not considered by the IRS to be a significant portion of the major component. Therefore, it passes the restoration test and assuming that it passes the other tests of not being a betterment or not adapting to a new or different use, the expenditure associated with replacing this furnace would, would be considered a current year expense. So let's look at another restoration example. If a taxpayer replaces the chiller in their building and it's the only chiller in the HVAC system, and we've essentially replaced a major component that's performing a discrete and critical function um, because the system's inoperable without the chiller. So notice that we replaced the chiller here with a comparable unit so we don't have an issue with a betterment test. However, we fail the restoration test and we have still have to capitalize it. On the other hand, assuming the facts are the same and that the, the replaced chiller was one of four chillers, we might consider it a minor component and treat the chiller cost as a repair. Uh, as a repair expense. So another HVAC example, um, we have 10 rooftop units, rooftop units um, 
you know, surveying the various zones in our building. Due to climate control problems in some offices, we decided to replace three of those units. It's obvious that 10 units would comprise a major component of the HVAC system. Over three units is only 30%, so it's not a significant portion of the major component. So those three units are not a substantial structural part of the HVAC system. Um, therefore, in, in this example, um, the replacement is not a restoration, and assuming it's not a betterment, then the expenditure could be deducted as a repair expense. Now, some of you may be also wondering about the, the new provision under TCJA for treating items like, um, like HVAC as an expense under 179 and whether it would apply here. The answer to that's yes, it absolutely would apply. Um, so there's another option to consider. Even if you've replaced all 10 units, you could still take the 179 expense deduction. Um, let's say you've already hit the cap on 179 expense and that's no longer an option um, in the scenario that, that we have here. Um, you could still deduct the cost of those three units as a repair just because it fails one test doesn't mean it won't pass a different test. So again, some planning opportunities. So here's a couple of, uh, of pictures uh, to show you how things look in the real world. Uh, in the left picture here, you'll see five rooftop uh, mounted HVAC units. In the right picture, there are four uh, ground-mounted units. It's fairly easy to see the, these two situations to figure out um, whether you've replaced a significant portion or a major part of the HVC system. Um, it can be somewhat challenging in larger, more complex buildings where HVAC components are concealed in the ceilings or in the mechanical rooms or you know, on, on, you know, in, in HVAC closets and things like that. The uh, the KBKG uh, guide to roofing. So a, a, a common building component that gets a lot of attention with respect to repairs is the roof. We actually published an article on expensing roofing costs in uh, the tax advisor a year or two ago now, and I, I think you might find it helpful. The web address is posted on the slide here, um, and I, I think it's also within the uh, the handouts that, that you guys um, can download from our site. But um, the same restoration analysis that we discussed with the HVAC components applies to the roofing system. So the roof system falls into that ninth category of the, the building structure, the building shell, um, separate and apart from the, the eight defined building systems. So in order to assess whether a substantial structural part or a major component has been replaced, it's helpful to kind of take a step back and understand the basic components found in a roof system. So most common roofs fall into two major types. First type is a steep pitch roof assembly, which is most commonly found in residential rental properties. Um, the component parts of this assembly include three primary parts. There's the, the underlying roof deck, um, which is in our picture is, is a wood deck supported by the wood rafters. Um, the next layer is the underlayment, which provides a weatherproofing barrier and is sometimes referred to as the felt or the paper. And then the last layer is the roof covering which can include various types of shingles, clay, concrete, tile, steel, slate, um, even you know metal roofing systems. Low pitch roof systems are more commonly found in commercial buildings and consist of three sections too. Uh, the first layer is the roof decking, which is typically like a, a corrugated metal panel um, supported by some structural beams. Next layer is an optional layer of, of insulation. Unlike the steep roof, uh, steep pitch roof, where the insulation is below the deck in an attic space. Um, the low pitch roof systems frequently include a, a layer of insulation between the, the deck and the roof cover. And then the final layer of the is, is the roof cover or other otherwise known as the membrane. Um, some common types of roof covers include um, built up um, roofs, um, metal roof systems, modified bitumen, uh, membranes, synthetic membranes, thermoplastic membranes, and spray polyurethane foam-based uh, uh, roof systems. So once you understand the type of components that you have and the scope of, and what the scope of the replacement was, you can apply the tangible property regs to determine whether the work should be considered a repair or an expense. So the questions on this slide here will help you discover the relevant facts. Um, why was the roof? Why, why did the roof need to be replaced? If it was because of a casualty loss event and the taxpayer 
properly deducted the casualty lost by reducing the basis um, by the amount of the loss, the, the cost of the new roof should be capitalized. Um, if the building's basis was less than the casualty loss, then the excess portion is capitalized only if it meets all the other criteria um, you know, as an improvement. How much of each roof layer was replaced? Um, if the outer roof covering, you know, the, the membrane, shingles, et cetera, was replaced, but none of the underlying roof system, it's not a restoration. If any load-bearing structural elements, including the, the decking or the sheathing that we, that we talked about, were, were replaced that supported more than 40% of the roof, the entire cost is likely a restoration. If more than 40% of the insulation layer between the roof covering and the structural elements was replaced, it, it's probably a restoration as well. So was the roof um, work part of a project to return the building structure to its ordinary and operating condition after it you know, deteriorated um, or was, was you know, past a, a state of disrepair or no longer um, able for its functional use, uh, for its intended use? Um, most building structures can, fall, um, can continue to function um, to some degree with, with roof problems. Um, at some point, the disrepair of a roof becomes significant enough to impede the normal functions of the building structure, and the cost of the roof work must be capitalized as a restoration. Um, typically not the case, but it, it, it can happen. Um, did the taxpayer claim a retirement loss or partial disposition on any portion of the old roof? If so, then the cost of the new roof work needs to be capitalized as a restoration. Um, how much time elapsed between the building acquisition and the roof work? So this was kind of touched on in our question. Um, generally, if the roof work needs to be done soon after the building was acquired, typically we say two years or, or later, it might fall into a betterment category um, because the work was co corrected with a material defect or a uh, condition that existed before the, the building was acquired. However, if a, a longer period of time has, has come or has passed that, um, since the original building acquisition, then it, it generally doesn't fall into that category. And, would, you know, again, depending on the type of work, may, may be a, uh, an expense or repair and maintenance. And then another question is, um, you know, what kind of roofing was there and what kind is, is it being replaced with? Um, you know, we, we have to look back at that, that betterment question, right? Are we going from asphalt shingles up to something that's significantly more efficient and, you know, more energy, energy efficient and things like that? Um, and then the last question is, did the roof work relate to the physical enlargement of a building? Um, you know, if, if so, the enlargement portion of the roof's capitalized, clearly, as that wasn't there before, um, but depending on facts and circumstances, maybe the portion of the roof um, over the existing building um, may, may, able to be, or may be able to be expensed as repair and maintenance. So um, here's a couple of kind of high level quick examples, um, applying the regs to roofing work. So here in, in the first example, Taxpayer X replaces 60% of the roof decking, the insulation, the roof membrane. Um, in that scenario, X replaced a major portion of the roof system, so it's considered a restoration and must be capitalized. Um, second example, taxpayer Y replaces the outer roof membrane and does so with a comparable product, so it's, it's not a betterment. Um, the roof membrane alone, even though it um, affects the function of the building, and even though it's 100% of the total membrane, is considered to be only a minor portion of the total system, and therefore it, it's not a restoration and not a betterment, and could be deducted as, an ex, as a uh, repair expense. Um, in my experience, a, a high percentage of the invoices for roofing repairs can, can potentially be treated as a current year repair expense. The key is to ask really insightful questions and to assemble the facts and circumstances and really tell the story um, about the, the work that was performed. Uh, the last slide that I'm gonna show here is, is uh, related to the, some restoration examples focusing on paving. Um, in the, the picture on the left, you'll see the application of a slurry coat seal. The asphalt is not being replaced. It's just uh, receiving a protective coating, which will slow the deterioration of the paving on the right side, you'll see the asphalt that's that's cracked and the cracks have been repaired. Um, both procedures are normal maintenance that are recommended to preserve the character of the paving. 
both would pass the betterment and restoration tests and be deductible as current year expenditures. So to this point, we've talked about um, you know, the repair and capitalization. Now we're gonna shift the gears a little bit and focus our attention briefly on retirements and dispositions, and then we'll move on to a few other topics. Um, the final disposition regs were issued back in August of 2014. Um, almost a, a year after the tangible property regs were finalized. The, the current rules allow for taxpayers to actually take a loss deduction when they remove anything from the building. Um, so for example, you pay $50,000 to replace all of the HVAC units in your building with new ones. You've determined that you need to capitalize that amount. Um, the $50,000 is recovered over 39 years. However, you, you now figure out that you know, how much of the remaining basis is left in the old HVAC units, and you can claim that amount as an immediate deduction in the tax year that this occurs. Um, this is considered a, a, quote, partial disposition and can only be done on a go-forward basis in conjunction with a timely filed return. When these regs first came out, there was an opportunity to retroactively take advantage of the, the late partial dispositions from prior years. That retroactive opportunity ex has expired, um, so if a taxpayer really fails to take advantage of the partial disposition in conjunction with the current tax year, they forego the opportunity to recognize the partial dispositions forever on that, that particular expenditure. So um, if you acquired an existing building and you don't know how to calculate the remaining basis in a component of the building, you may want to take advantage of our partial disposition calculator um, at the link on, on this slide. We've created this tool for, for that very situation. Um, it relies upon the producer pricing index um, in conjunction with some other factors to estimate the remaining basis of specific expenditures. We'll talk more about how the calculator works in a later slide though. So um, let's look at an example to see how the impact, how much impact this can have. So let's suppose a taxpayer acquired a building in 2012 for $5 million. Later in 2019, they spent a um, you know, million dollars to remodel part of the second floor. Um, suppose that you know we came in and we analyzed the the cost of the uh, the demolished components, and we discovered that they represent $470,000 of the original five million. Um, the result is that the taxpayer could recognize that loss of $404,000 in that 2019 tax year. I guess I need to. To update these to the 2020 tax year since we're entering 2020 tax filings um, but that that's the original cost of the uh, the original cost basis less the depreciation that was already taken um, so remember all of this you, you can only take advantage of these on a um, on a timely filed return or extended return um, but you know we, we can't retroactively go back and do that so if you don't take advantage of this you you, you lose that opportunity um, and you just have to continue to depreciate it out until it's uh, until it's fully depreciated or, or sold or disposed. Um, <laughs> the reason retirements are significant is that they result in permanent tax savings too. So if you incorrectly continue to depreciate section 1245 and section 1250 property that was removed from a building, you'll eventually pay recapture tax upon the sale of the property. We say incorrectly because the retirement rules indicate that you should take the disposition in the current year when the uh, when the assets disposed of um, the regs don't say that you may they say you should um, so you know you, you should take that disposition so if you don't you're missing out on a benefit that was intended for you to enjoy permanent savings are a result of a uh, of differing tax rates between 1245 recapture which is at ordinary rates and 1250 recapture um, at 25 percent and, and capital gains rates at 20%. So let's look at, uh, at our previous example where the taxpayer acquired the building um, for $5 million, had $470,000 in retirements. Um, if the taxpayer had not taken that retire those retirement deductions, they would have continued to depreciate that $470,000 um, until the property is one day is sold and then recapture would be then re uh, required. So let's say $370,000 of the basis was 39-year life property and $100,000 was seven-year life property. 
the recapture tax on the real property would be 370,000 times 25%, um, and then add that to the $100,000 at 37% for the personal property for total recapture tax of $129,500. However, as a result of the retirement study, the recapture tax now goes to zero. Um, there is a capital gain tax on the 470,000 at, at 20 percent for a total of 94,000 dollars. So the net difference between the 129,5 and the 94,000 is is really a permanent tax savings upon sale of 35,500 dollars. Um, so for removal costs and demolition, uh, prior to the tangible property regs, removal costs. Of, of an old component generally had to be capitalized with the cost of the new component. Under the current law, removal costs can be deducted only if the taxpayer retires the remaining basis from the old component that was replaced. So in our example, landlord here had, um, spends $200,000 on a leasehold improvement um, in each of the three tenant spaces in, in year one. Later in year five, new tenant leases one of the spaces and it's required requires the landlord to completely demolish the leasehold improvements in that space and rebuild it to their specs. Uh, the total spend is $340,000, of which $40,000 was for demolition of the old tenant build out. In this scenario, the landlord could expense that $40,000 of demo and deduct the remaining basis in the $200,000 of uh, cost for the old build out. Under prior law, the $400,000 or the $40,000 of demo costs would have to be capitalized um, as part of the new construction cost, or if there's no uh, disposition being taken, they're, they're capitalized. So now that we've established the importance of determining the remaining basis of retired assets, let's go over your options for calculating that remaining depreciable basis. The easiest way would be to look at a cost sec study and then see if the item is already broken out for you. If you can identify the original basis of the retired component, it's easy enough to calculate the amount of tax depreciation taken to date and the remaining depreciable basis of the component. In addition to using the cost seg study, the IRS states that another reasonable method could be uh, discounting the cost of the replacement component back to its place in service year using the producer pricing index. While this approach can be used for certain restorations only, the, the final regs do not allow this method to be used for betterments or adaptations. It only makes sense if you think about it. Um, for example, you've, you've got a standard roof um, and you replace it with a much more expensive solar roof. Um, it wouldn't make sense to use the replacement cost of that dissimilar component to derive the historical cost of the standard roof. Similarly, if you replace the HVC system in an office space that was converted to a restaurant, it wouldn't make sense to use the much more expensive restaurant HVAC as a starting point to derive the historical cost of the HVAC system in the office. Um, mentioned earlier in the slides that KBKG has developed that partial disposition calculator. Um, again, I've reproduced the link here. Our calculator uses the producer pricing index to discount the cost back to the date of the original acquisition. It also has the ability to adjust for um, perceived condition um, of the asset, which we'll discuss on the next slide here. So a little bit of caution about using that discounting method. Simply using the PPI index to discount the current cost back to the date of original construction is a good way to estimate the historical cost as if new. However, this stops short of taking into account the fact that the asset may, be, have, a, may have been acquired, used, and may not be in 100% good condition or like new when it was acquired. So let's consider this example where a building was acquired a few years ago and now the owner in the current year is spending $200,000 to replace all of the aluminum windows. Discounting the current cost um, of the replacement windows back three years using the PPI results in an estimated historical cost basis of $186,000 for the windows. Now, if the building were brand new and acquired, this would be a reasonable estimate. However, in our example, we don't know the actual age of the building or the windows. So one way to adjust for a condition um, of the windows is to assume that they had three years of remaining life left when acquired. We can determine from various estimating sources that the normal life of an aluminum window is 20 years. So in our case, that implies an effective age of 17 years for the windows at the time of acquisition. 
Um, we can, again, turn to an, a number of different depreciation tables to find the historical condition factors um, that you know take us from a 20-year expected life and a 17-year effective age. This allows us to conclude an appropriate condition factor would be 27%, which is applied to historical cost of $186,000, results in a value of $50,220. This is a condition-adjusted value of the windows at the time of acquisition which can be used to, accumulate, to calculate accumulated depreciation and then the remaining tax basis of the retired windows. The, uh, the KBKG partial disposition calculator uses the PPI index to trend the cost back to, back, cost new back to the time of acquisition. It also has a depreciation tables and expected lives built in for most of the commonly replaced components. Um, so it can estimate condition adjustments um, you know, and, and do all of this math for you. Um, a last word of caution about using the PPI discounting model. I strongly encourage reading our article that's that's referenced at the bottom of the slide um, that, that elaborates more on it. Uh, materials and supplies, as I said earlier in the presentation, uh, we'd focus on some other opportunities related to buildings and, and leasehold improvements. So you might be surprised to, to see a slide on materials and supplies. Um, However, for taxpayers that are manufacturing companies, materials and supplies can be a very significant cost and, and worth talking about. Materials and supplies are tangible, non-inventory property um, used and consumed in your operations, including um, acquired components, um, consumables, 12-month property, and then property with a, units of property with a, a cost of less than $200. Um, all of these can, can be deducted um, whether they be um, deducted immediately or, or deducted when, when used or consumed, um, depends on the, the characteristic, but um, they, they all fall into the material and supply category. Um, under the prior rules, you, you can deduct the cost of incidental and non-incidental materials and supplies in the following manner. Um, incidental materials and supplies, um, if the materials and supplies are incidental, um, i.e. of minor or secondary importance, carried on hand without keeping a record of consumption, um, you know, and, and no beginning and ending inventory is recorded. You know, think of things like pens and staplers and toner and all of that stuff. Um, you deduct those materials and supplies costs in the taxable year in which the amounts are paid or incurred. And then non-incidental materials and supplies, um, those are, or if the materials and supplies are are, um, are non-incidental, then you deduct those um, in the tax year in which the materials and supplies are first used or consumed in the operations. So, for example, um, you deduct certain expendable spare parts in a trucking business for which records of consumption are kept and inventories are recorded. Um, you know, things like you know parts in the tool crib, things like that, um, and then the uh, application of the de minimis safe harbor. If you elect to use the, the, the de minimis safe harbor and any materials and supplies also qualify for the de minimis safe harbor, um, you must deduct those amounts paid for these materials and supplies under the safe harbor in the taxable year in which the amounts are paid or incurred. Um, here's a couple of, of quick examples where taxpayer benefited from the materials and supplies rules. On the left photo, um, there's a, a number of, of large beer kegs. In the right photo, you'll see some rolling waste bins. In both examples, the cost of each individual unit was less than $200, um, and they weren't tracked in any kind of record-keeping inventory. The taxpayer was able to take the de minimis safe harbor for these items since it uh, would not have caused the material, it, since it would have caused a material misstatement for gap purposes. However, they were able to treat them as materials and supplies and immediately deduct them um, since there's no book tax conformity requirement for those materials and supplies. Uh, the routine maintenance safe harbor. Uh, under the routine maintenance safe harbor, you are not required to capitalize as an improvement um, and therefore may deduct amounts that meet all of the following criteria. Um, so amounts paid for recurring activities that you expect to perform as a result of your use of the property and your trade or business to keep the property in its ordinary and operating uh, condition. So um, 
And then the other caveat there is that you reasonably expect at the time the property is placed into service to perform those activities more than once during the class life of the property. For building structures and building systems, you must reasonably expect to perform those activities more than once during a 10-year period. Um, so in our example here, you expect to replace the escalator handrails once every five years, so you've satisfied the routine maintenance safe harbor. Um, note that you don't actually have to replace the handrails once every five years, you just need to have re a reasonable expectation that you would replace them every five years. Um, if, if the amount doesn't meet all of the requirements for routine maintenance safe harbor, you may still deduct the amount um, if the amount is not an improvement under the facts and circumstances analysis from before. Um, so in our example here, um, we expect to replace an HVAC unit every 12 years, so it fails the routine maintenance safe harbor test. Um, however, it could potentially still pass the bar test to be deducted in the current year as a, as a repair expense. Um, you know, here's another quick example of how the routine maintenance safe harbor benefited, benefited one of our taxpayers' uh, clients in a significant way. In the photo on the left um, is one of three identical kilns used in their business activities. Each kiln was lined with refractory bricks similar to what you see in the photo on the right. The taxpayer would shut down operations for one week in July to replace the refractory brick in one of the three units. Each year, the taxpayer would replace the similar brick with one of the three units on a rotating basis at cost um, of approximately $300,000. Um, they maintained great records showing that this was done on a regular basis, and we were able to demonstrate a reasonable expectation that they would replace the brick more than once during the class life of the property. So that annual um, expenditure that they have falls into the routine maintenance safe harbor. The small, um, the safe harbor for small taxpayers, um, you are not required to capitalize as an improvement and therefore may be permitted to deduct the cost of work performed on owned or leased buildings, e.g. Um, repairs, maintenance, improvements, or similar costs that fall into the safe harbor uh, election for small taxpayers. Requirements for the uh, safe harbor election are average annual gross receipts of 10 million or less and owns or leases building property with an unadjusted basis of 1 million or less, and the total amount paid during the taxable year for the repairs and maintenance um, activities on the building doesn't exceed the lesser of 2% of the adjusted basis, uh, unadjusted basis or $10,000. Um, and keep in mind that you, you may elect the safe harbor um, for each taxable year in which qualifying mines, amounts are incurred. Um, the, the planning idea that we have here at the bottom of this slide is a taxpayer could be in a situation where a cost sex study might reduce their real property basis in a building enough to make them eligible for this safe harbor. So in, in this example, we got a taxpayer, we have a taxpayer, um, they had a building basis of $1.3 million prior to a cost sex study. After reclassifying 400,000 to five year and 15 year life uh, recovery periods, the remaining 39 year life basis is 900,000, which puts them just below the $1 million threshold and then uh, makes them eligible for the, um, the safe harbor. Uh, the plan of rehabilitation um, is, is obsolete. Prior to the tangible property regs, um, repairs made to a building in conjunction with a larger rehab project had to be capitalized. Now, um, however, if, if those repairs and maintenance type costs weren't incurred because of the improvement, they can be expensed in the current year. So the question becomes, was the expense necessary to complete the improvement? Um, here's a quick examples. If a taxpayer spends $500,000 to rewire the building and incurs $30,000 of cost to repair the drywall that was damaged because of the process of uh, those electrical upgrades, the total cost of 530 must be capitalized. However, if the $30,000 of, of cost of drywall repairs was totally unrelated to the electrical work, it could potentially be expensed as a repair, assuming that the other conditions are met. The, uh, the de minimis rule, several of our other prior slides have referenced the de minimis, de minimis rule election. Under the final tangible regs, you may elect to apply a de minimis safe harbor to amounts paid to acquire or produce tangible property to the extent those amounts are, are deducted 
by you for uh, financial accounting purposes. <laughs> if you have an applicable financial statement, you may use the safe harbor to deduct amounts paid for tangible property up to $5,000 per invoice per item. If you don't have an applicable financial statement, you may use the safe harbor to deduct amounts up to $2,500 per invoice per item. Um, these limitations are for purposes of determining whether particular expenses qualify under the safe harbor. They are not intended as a ceiling on the amount you can deduct as a business expense. Um, so one thing to, to keep in mind here is you, you cannot split the costs um, among multiple invoices. Let's say you buy a $10,000 piece of equipment, splitting it by four invoices gets $2,500 of expense. No, it, it's still one $10,000 item. Um, but there, there is a tremendous opportunity um, for things. You know, we, we talked a little bit earlier, somebody had the question about a, a computer monitor. Um, you know, I, I, I would argue that that would be a, a capitalized item. Um, but I would also argue that it, it probably falls under the de minimis rule um, and would be expensed under the de minimis safe harbor. Um, an applicable financial statement, I mentioned in the last slide, um, it includes a, a financial statement. The definition for that is, um, you know, a, a statement to be uh, filed with the SEC as well as other types of audited financial statements by a CPA, um, you know, including loan statements, uh, reporting to shareholders, um, and other non-tax purposes. And then uh, last thing we'll touch on before I let you guys go for the, the day is um, the retail and restaurant industry safe harbor. After these regulations came out um, back in 2013 and 14, the National Retail Federation lobbied uh, for the recognition of regular remodels performed in retail and restaurants, uh, restaurant properties to keep them commit competitive and up-to-date. The result of that lobbying was Revenue Procedure 2015-56, which provides a safe harbor um, for those taxpayers that meet the criteria. Generally, the safe harbor benefits those enhancing the physical appearance and layout of buildings to maintain an attractive environment for their customers. The safe harbor allows 75% of the qualified amounts to be deducted as a current year expense and the remaining 25% would be capitalized. Um, in addition to the, the obvious tax benefits, it also relieves a, a significant amount of burden um, when it comes to evaluating unit of property and tracking assets and things like that. So um, this was a tremendously beneficial um, you know, revenue procedure related to the, the, the retail and restaurant industry. Um, to qualify as a for the, the retail and restaurant industry safe harbor, a, a taxpayer must have an applicable financial statement. Um, the taxpayer must be in the retail business uh, or they must be in the trade of selling merchandise, including goods to resellers such as warehouse clubs, um, and home improvement stores, things like that. Um, certain types of retail activities are excluded though, automobile dealers, um, other motor vehicle dealers, gas stations, manufactured home dealers, and non-store retailers are, are precluded from that. Um, if a taxpayer is in the restaurant business, they must be in the, the trader business of preparing or selling meals, um, eh, snacks or beverages to customers for immediate on-premise or off-premise consumption. Um, certain types of restaurant activities are excluded, including hotels and motels. Um, list of what's, what's not considered qualified property. Um, all of these items must be removed from the total costs before calculating that 75%, um, you know, safe harbor calculation. So things like 1245 property, intangibles, land, um, material additions, you know, uh, all, all of that stuff. So, and then um, to qualify for the the, the um, safe harbor. Um, you have to have your applicable financial statement. Um, you have to be in the, the appropriate business. And um, we have a, a more detailed article. I think it's a three or four page article here that, that breaks that down. Um, there are a, a few different modifications associated with it um, since this is a four year old uh, revenue procedure at this time. But I would suggest um, going to, to, our, um, to our article here and um, if you have any additional questions to to contact me and we can talk through that. Um, so the last thing, I, I promise the last thing I want to talk about 
is the IRS audit technique guide. Um, the IRS issued an audit technique guide related to tangible property regulations, um, you know, a few years back. And, um, you know, it, it's a, a very robust um, technique guide, outlines the, the processes for auditing this type of analysis. And it also provides, um, you know, I have roughly another hundred examples um, for interpretation of the regulations. Um, so when you're trying to do those facts and circumstances tests, um, it's a great read um, and, and a, a great um, uh, tool for, uh, for the toolkit. Um, as we near the end here, um, some, some method changes to think about. I mentioned repairs method changes number 184. Um, other ones that we often see in conjunction with related related to repairs are change number seven, the depreciation changes, um, doing things in tandem with cost segregation. Um, and then also um, disposition of structural components that are separately stated. Um, it's, it's DCN 205. It's essentially ghost assets, um, you know, identifying assets that are no longer there that are on your depreciation schedule. How can KBKG help? Um, you know, we, we have a team of experts um, that, that live, breathe, um, depreciation and, and all things related. Um, we can help um, review depreciation schedules for opportunities. We can help quantify, um, file the 3115s, um, everything from soup to nuts, essentially. And then I mentioned before our KBKG solution site, there's um, a multitude of different um, calculators, the partial disposition calculator, a 41A adjustment calculator, um, and then you know a, a, all of our, our information um, related to this webinar and things like that.